So, hello everyone. Um, yes, I'm Lorraine. I'm a first time volunteer and I'm really looking forward to working with some of you over the winter. In my professional life, I'm actually a, a food inspector in local authorities. <laughs> <laughs> so, none of you will want to work with me, I guess. <laughs> No, seriously, you know, I've, I've worked in Lewisham, Bromley, uh, Haringey, Westminster, so, you know, I am quite experienced in that field. But, you know, I'm sure many of you will have provided meals for your families, for extended families, at functions, at parties, etc. So, the good habits that you bring to the shelter kitchens will be great. There may be some things we'd rather you left at home, but what I really wanted to do today was to give you some information about why we might ask you to work in certain ways in the kitchen. Our guests may have underlying medical conditions which make them particularly vulnerable to food poisoning. And no one wants that. So, you're very welcome. Uh, I hope that none of the kitchens are going to look like this. So food safety is really being proactive to do everything you can to make sure no one gets sick from eating the food you provide. So we're not talking about the nutritional quality of the food. It's about just making sure that no one gets sick. So there are three types of contamination that we don't want to find in food. Biological, chemical, and physical. Physical contamination is when there's something in the food that shouldn't be there and you can actually see it. So it could be something that's dropped in there or somehow got in there. It could be a fingernail, a hair, a cigarette end, a plaster, a piece of glass, a piece of string. All of these would be physical contaminants. <coughs> Chemical contamination would be something like using the wrong type of cleaning chemical. So cleaning chemicals that we like to see in food situations are not perfumed because the smell could taint the food. So they would be non-perfumed and not pine smelling, you know, something like that. And also to make sure you wash fruit and vegetables before using them to get, try and get rid of any pesticides that might be remaining. Probably the most important thing is the biological contamination. There we're talking about bacteria and viruses. So to prevent physical contamination, just make sure that nothing can fall into the food while you're preparing it. So for example, thinking about how would you try and prevent hair from falling into the food? At the very least, tie your hair back. So if you have long hair, just tie it back. No one likes to find a hair in their food. And consider bringing an apron to work with you, a clean apron. Not saying that any of us are dirty people, but we might have fibres on our clothes, pet hairs. So it's good practice to wear an apron. So wear an apron, tie your hair back. And think about making sure that things Nothing physical gets into the food. Chemicals, as I've said, is keep cleaning chemicals away from food and follow the manufacturer's instructions when you're using those cleaning chemicals. And biological, the bacteria, the two main things to remember, have high standards of personal hygiene, so washing your hands, etc and keep raw foods away from ready to eat foods so we know that raw meat contains harmful bacteria 
it doesn't really matter that it's in there because we're going to cook that meat and they'll be mostly killed. But any blood or juices that come from that raw meat into ready to eat food are going to cause a problem. So bacteria need these four things <clears throat> in order to grow. They need food, moisture, warmth and time. There are three general types of bacteria. Remember, bacteria are everywhere, but we can't see them with our eyes. There are some that are useful, where we actually put good bacteria into food to make that food. So that would be yogurt, cheese, salami. We actually use bacteria to make those foods. Spoilage bacteria are the ones that make food go off. Now they could make you ill, but by the time there are enough of them, the food would be so smelly, so green, so slimy, that you wouldn't eat it anyway. You could use your senses to know that that food was not safe to eat. However, the pathogens, the ones that cause food poisoning, you don't need many of them to make you ill and you have no way of knowing that they're in the food. The food will smell all right, look all right, taste all right. You have no way of knowing that food poisoning bacteria are in the food. So bacteria find their way into the kitchen, could be on us, could be most definitely in raw meat and poultry, could be in the dirt that's on vegetables that grow in the soil. They can be spread around from place to place on hands, equipment, utensils. Remember, you don't know where they are. You can't see them. So, cross-contamination is when bacteria are transferred from one place to another by someone or something. <coughs> Direct contamination could come from raw meat or poultry actually touching some ready-to-eat food. Or you may have been cutting up some raw chicken to marinate it. You finish doing that and then you begin cutting some ready-to-eat food on the same chopping board. or some blood or juices drip from raw meat into a trifle. <laughs> if, if you go into a kebab shop, think about when you see the kebabs in the display chiller. So you say, oh yeah, I'd like one of those please. So they lift it out to cook it. Okay, they're gonna cook that raw meat, so that, that's gonna be fine. But they sometimes lift it over all the salads that they've got lined up behind. It's okay. You won't see it, you know, you won't see what drips into the salad. You won't know you've got a problem till you start to eat it, or rather, oh, even after that. <laughs> <clears throat> so, in order to prevent contamination, keep raw and ready to eat foods apart. Don't use the same equipment, knives, chopping boards, for raw and ready to eat food unless you've properly cleaned and sanitised them. And make sure that you wash your hands between jobs. Bacteria like to grow best between temperatures of 5 and 63 Celsius. So that includes our body temperatures in that range and so is room temperature. So in a warm kitchen, it might be 22 Celsius. Leaving something out in a room will allow bacteria to grow in it. So food poisoning is mostly caused by bacteria. The symptoms, I'm sure you already know, 
abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, like a feeling of wanting to be sick. You might become dehydrated. You might collapse. And for vulnerable groups, this can be a very serious condition. For many of us, it might just mean staying indoors, rushing to the loo, you know, for 24 or 48 hours, but it can be a lot more serious than that. I'll just take a couple of minutes to, to tell you a true story, and you can Google it and find out for yourselves. There's a particularly horrible bacterium, E. coli, Escherichia coli. <coughs> It's found in animals, so it's found in raw meat. It cannot survive cooking. So once you thoroughly cook something, you kill it. it. It cannot survive. You don't need many of them to make you ill. And it not only causes symptoms of food poisoning, it can go on to cause kidney failure. There have been a number of outbreaks of E. coli food poisoning. One in particular, some time ago now in Wales, where there was a big catering butcher. He's a butcher, he had raw meat, that's fine. He also used to cook meat, slice it, and supply it to schools for school dinners. Again, nothing wrong with any of that, except that on one occasion, the cooked meat somehow became contaminated by the raw meat. Remember, it looked all right, smelled all right, and tasted all right. It was supplied to schools, the children ate it, and fell sick. One boy, five years old, called Mason Jones, died. That butcher never meant to do that. One mistake was all it took. So please, you know, I'm not trying to be overdramatic. Mistakes happen and they can have severe consequences. So, in terms of, I'm not entirely familiar with how, you know, actually what takes place in the kitchens here. So, just to run through, you may be defrosting something. It should be defrosted in the fridge, so in plenty of time, rather than leaving it out overnight, because you're more like, you know, you won't have so many bacteria growing in it. It's more under control. Remember during preparation, I keep on about it, keep raw and ready to eat food separately. And don't leave high risk foods out in the kitchen just sitting about once you finish working with them. If you need to, pop it back in the fridge. The safest thing to do with any food is cook it and eat it straight away. It's always the safest thing to do because any bacteria that survive cooking won't have the opportunity to grow. So it's always the safest thing. So I understand from Rob that occasionally volunteers may prepare food at home, cook it at home, cool it, put it in the fridge hopefully, and then bring it and reheat it. Done, that can be done safely, but it is much better if you can find a way of cooking on site and serving it straight away. All the foods that are provided should be thoroughly cooked. And remember in particular, minced meat products like sausages, burgers, and also um, poultry should be cooked thoroughly all the way through. Never ever serve these undercooked. You would know various ways of checking whether things are thoroughly cooked. So as I said, once you have cooked it, serve it straight away. <clears throat> if you do need to cool it, cool it as quickly as you can within two hours and put it in the fridge. Remember, never put hot food straight in the fridge because that will raise the temperature of the fridge and also cause condensation. Always make sure, again, that no blood or juices from raw foods can drip onto ready-to-eat food. I just want to say something about rice. 
<laughs> because if people, you know, sometimes people get sick after eating curry and rice and they always want to blame the curry, but it could actually be the rice. So there's a particular bacterium called Bacillus cereus, which loves to be in rice. It will be in dry rice when you buy it. But when it's in dry conditions, it's in a sort of protective coat that we call a spore. While it's in that spore, it can't grow, it can't multiply. It just sits in there. So when you cook the rice, it's too hot for the bacteria. So they, they just stay inside the spore, they don't do anything. If you eat the rice straight away, it just goes into your body and out again, that's fine. Again, they don't do anything. But if you cook the rice and then leave it to cool, as it cools down, they quite like it. So they break out of the spore and they start growing very quickly and they produce a poison, a toxin, which even if you reheat the rice, you don't kill. So with rice, as with any other food, can you ever see that, or is it invisible? Invisible. <coughs> no. So that cut, you know, that rice that you ate for breakfast the next morning, you left it out on the side after you had a takeaway. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> um, yeah. So with rice, as with any other food, cook it, eat it straight away or cook it, cool it, put it in the fridge, or cook it and keep it hot. Particularly in some commercial situations, they would have a rice cooker, which cooks the rice and then keeps it hot. Okay. So just to move on quickly to cleaning. Cleaning is defined as a process to remove dirt, grease and contamination. If you use a detergent, a detergent will remove dirt and grease and it will take away the bacteria in the dirt and grease, but it doesn't kill them, so it doesn't kill bacteria. We have lots of cleaning products available to us nowadays and you may be familiar with a sanitizer. So a sanitizer does clean and disinfect. So it cleans and kills bacteria. But the important things to remember, if the surface is very greasy or dirty, you need to take that away with a detergent first and then use your sanitizer. And the important thing about sanitizers is the contact time. So if you look at the instructions, it will tell you how long to leave the sanitizer on to make sure it kills bacteria. So it needs to work effectively. So read the instructions. Where in the kitchen do you need to disinfect? So you might say, oh, I bleached the floor. I don't mind if you bleach the floor or not because you're not making food on the floor and we're walking on it. So that's up to you. But what must be disinfected to kill bacteria is equipment and utensils, any surfaces that food touches, any surfaces that your hands touch, so fridge door handles, taps, that sort of thing, and cloths. And the last topic really is personal hygiene. As I said, it's best for you to tie your hair back and wear an apron. We're not going to, I don't think, ask you to, you know, wear a hairnet and a white coat. But I think it would be reasonable to wear an apron. And wash your hands regularly you're going to be thinking, oh, for goodness sake, you know, we all wash our hands after using the toilet. Actually, people don't. I can be in the ladies' toilets in my office building, environmental health. I can be in a cubicle. And I, what, you know, in another cubicle, I hear the toilet flush. I hear the, t the door handle, the toilet door handle. And what's the next sound I hear? It's not the tap. It's the outside door. So I finish my business, I flush the toilet, I come out, I wash my hands, and what, 
what do I do? I'm not going to touch that door handle. I'm not. No, seriously, are we not going to just blame the men here, are we? I know they're outnumbered, but I'm, you know, I'm being a bit facetious, but please think about what you're doing and think about washing your hands. So it should be as soon as you walk into the kitchen, for whatever reason you left it, because you don't know what you've been touching outside. So for whatever reason you left the kitchen, wash your hands when you come back in, particularly after you use the toilet and between different jobs. Wash your hands properly. I believe I've been told that if you sing the song Happy Birthday through twice, that's the time it should take you to wash your hands properly. So bear that in mind. That's how long it should take. Don't, you know, don't just wash, rinse your fingers, wash them together, uh, rub them together and think that's it. Think about what you're doing. So some do's and don'ts. Do be clean and tidy when you're in the kitchen. It's already been said, but only food handlers should really come into the kitchen when you're working on food. And if you need, you know, if you're going to go to the toilet or you're going to go outside somewhere, take your apron off, don't wear it outside. Washing your hands regularly, we've spoken about and using a food safe sanitizer on the surfaces we've mentioned. Now, this is one that some people might find a little bit controversial. You shouldn't be washing raw meat and poultry. Now, what you do at home is up to you and I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't do it at home. But just bear in mind, this slide shows where water has hit the raw meat and poultry and it's splashed. So it's splashing onto surfaces, onto the apron. So just be mindful that if you do wash meat and poultry, any water that's touched it is contaminated and could be splashing everywhere around. If you have, if you're unwell, so if you have vomiting, diarrhea, and a heavy cold, sneezing, you shouldn't be working with food because you know you could easily pass those things on. Something called norovirus is very, very infectious, easily passed on. It's the virus that causes uh, closure of hospital wards, nurseries, it, people get it on cruise ships, anywhere where people are close together can easily be passed on. So if you have any of those symptoms, you need to tell your team leader in plenty of time that actually, you know, you're not fit for work. So finally, think about what you're doing when you're in the kitchen, concentrate on what you're doing, Try and lead by example so that everyone in your team has developed very good habits. And if there's something that you're being asked to do that you're unsure about, then just ask. And finally, finally, <coughs> if any of you are interested in finding out a bit more about food safety, then please let Rob or myself know because there is a possibility that we could run a, a certificated level two food hygiene course, which is a, a nationally recognized course for food handlers. So if anyone's interested in that, if there's enough people, we may be able to run that. So thank you very much.